everybody and welcome to another One History Help video with me, Mrs O'Neill. Today we start our journey into a course which is very, very close to my heart. It's one that I studied myself when I was doing GCSE History and I have really, really enjoyed teaching it as much as I've enjoyed learning it as well. I am talking about the many variations of a medicine through time course. Uh, for instance, those of you who study AQA, you would have done it under Britain, the health and the people. And I know it's a strong course on lots of other exam boards as well. So I'm really, really excited to be starting this with you today. I'm going to be doing four videos on the actual time periods themselves. This first one here is on medieval medicine, as you can see. And then I'll be doing another one on Renaissance, industrial and then modern medicine as well. I absolutely adore medieval history as well. It's something that I never really looked into in lots of detail until my first year of university when it was an option for me. And I kind of didn't really have anything else to choose from really when I was choosing my subjects to take. And I just absolutely fell in love with the period. It is just so, so fascinating. And I'm really looking forward to us talking through the real foundations and the roots of the medicine courses that exist. And one of the questions that I ask my students when we finish studying the medicine course is just how far have we solved the medical problems of the past? And many of them, as we are going to see, are rooted here in the medieval period. So this here is a nice visual of the different things that we are going to be having a look at. We're going to be taking a start looking at two people who didn't actually exist in the medieval times, but had a direct influence on medieval medicine, Hippocrates and Galen. We're then gonna look at how doctors were trained during the medieval times. We're gonna look at surgeons, hospitals, the Islamic empire and their medical developments. We're gonna take a special deep dive into the Black Death, one of my particular favorite areas of history. And then we're gonna look at public health in the medieval times as well. If you're going to study medicine or even just medical history, this is the guy you need to start with, Hippocrates, the father of medicine. Let's learn a little bit more about his developments that will go on to have an impact pretty much throughout our course. Hippocrates or Hippocrates, if you want a nice easy way to remember how to spell his name. Hippocrates was a Greek doctor who comes up with the theory of the four humours, which was the basis for medical treatment and diagnosis for centuries. Now, just so we're aware, the theory of the four humours that he comes up with, despite the fact it is used pretty much until the mid-Victorian times, is incorrect. It's based on the idea that your body is made up of four separate fluids or humours. Blood, yellow bile, black bile and phlegm. And if your humours were out of balance, then i.e. that you had more of one humour than another, then you would become ill. And I put there in brackets that it was to do with coming out of your body because we need to be aware that the Greeks were not dissecting human bodies at this time. Uh, sorry, in their in their time period, in the ancient Greeks times, we're not going to get a dissection during the medieval period either, as we will go on to discuss. So the theory of the four humours was based on what you could observe and what you could see. So, for instance, if you noticed that somebody was having a nosebleed, then that was because they had too much blood in their body. Their humour of blood was out of balance. Uh, for instance, if you, uh, you know, go to a wintertime one and you um, had a kind of runny nose and, and all the other afflictions of a cold, then you would be considered to have too much phlegm. There was too much phlegm in your body. And because it was coming out of your body, then essentially your body was trying to balance out your humours. So that is the basis of medical thinking for centuries. And it is incorrect, just to be very, very clear, but it will be believed for a very, very long time. Now, although I've, from how I've just described it, it kind of gives the impression that uh, the Greeks believed that the body itself regulated the balance of its humours, which is true to a certain extent. They also believed that you could yourself do something to balance out your humours. So one of the common treatments was bleeding, bloodletting, where they would take a vein, probably usually in somebody's arm was most common, but you could be bled from anywhere on your body. Uh, they would make an incision, they'd make a cut, 
uh, across it and they would uh, let you bleed essentially for a certain amount of time and the amount of time that you were bled and where you were bled from would often depend on the reason you were ill and the issue is is that this is an incredibly risky task because of how much blood they would drain from someone now if you're thinking oh my gosh but i've had blood tests before you may well know people who donate blood that is fine nowadays we are very very familiar with how much blood it is acceptable for a human being to lose uh, before they have lost too much blood the ancient greeks are unaware of this so they are letting blood for quite some time in some cases and actually they are endangering people's lives more so than helping them uh, another treatment to balance out humours, which was also used by the ancient Egyptians as well, uh, was purging. So making yourself sick or giving you a laxative to make things come out of your bottom. So that was another belief uh, as well that was extended from the ancient Egyptians. The Egyptians who believed that your digestive tract was the integral part of your body. And this is kind of extended by Hippocrates with his theory of the four humours. Hippocrates was also a fan of herbal remedies, looking to nature to be able to cure uh, and treat diseases. And also in terms of the long term impact of Hippocrates, he comes up with the Hippocratic Oath, which is an oath that all doctors swore to make sure that their work was ethical. So doctors would agree, for instance, to uh, doctor patient confidentiality. Uh, and uh, making sure that they would always work in the best interests of the patient. And that oath is still sworn by doctors today as well. Another thing that I haven't mentioned on here that Hippocrates was a big fan of was observation. He really strongly believed that doctors should observe their patients to understand better what was happening to them, especially when treatments were given. Don't just give them the treatment and send them away. Watch what happens. Does it make them better? And the idea would be as well as well as observing, you would record these observations down and these could then be used by doctors in the future to make improvements or to use the good work that you as a doctor had come up with. So Hippocrates, the father of medicine, incredibly influential throughout our study, pretty much like I said, up to the mid industrial, mid Victorian times until we start to get new theories about why disease happened. Um, I'll just mention this super quickly. Uh, the Greeks didn't just believe in the theory of the four humours, they also had religious beliefs about why illness happened as well. Uh, they believed that gods would both give and take illness away. And one of the uh, main gods with that in mind in ancient Greece uh, was the god Asclepius, or sometimes people pronounce it Asclepius, but I, I don't like that. I think I, I was always taught it was Asclepius. And people would go to the temple of Asclepius and make offerings to him uh, so that uh, illness would be taken away. Uh, they also, the ancient Greeks also set up these places called Asclepians, which were basically like, imagine a health spa, but you would go there if you were sick. So it's like a cross between a hospital and a spa. And at the Asclepian, you would stay there. They would be in these really serene, beautiful countryside locations, where which would be away from the noise and the pressures of city life. You would be able to relax there, you would sleep there, you would be fed a decent diet, and you'd also be encouraged to exercise as well. As well as that, Asclepians would have a temple to Asclepius in them, and you would go and you would pray there, and again, you'd make offerings and donations uh, in order for Asclepius to come and heal you. And there are lots of stories of people uh, from ancient Greece who went to these Asclepians. Uh, one, for instance, I've actually visited one, uh, the ruins of one on the island of Kos. And uh, there are lots of stories of people who went there and are cured. Um, and they put it all down to Asclepius. But actually, it's probably because for about what, a good couple of weeks to a month, uh, they live a very healthy lifestyle. So that uh, helped as well. So Hippocrates, incredibly important moving forward, but just wanted you to be aware that the ancient Greeks don't just believe in the thought theory of the four humours, they also believe that gods both give and take illness away. The next individual that we're going to have a look at is a Roman physician, a Roman doctor, and his name is Claudius Galen. So uh, Galen himself uh, was actually from Greece, but he is uh, around during the ancient Roman times. 
and he extends on some of Hippocrates' work. As I've read some people saying, uh, for instance, when I've read students' work, saying that he disproved Hippocrates' work. And that's not true. He takes Hippocrates' thoughts and he extends on them. And this is where we can talk a real lot, uh, sorry, a lot here about the distinctions between ancient Greeks and ancient Romans. Ancient Greeks were the people who were philosophers. They sat, they thought, and wanted to understand why things happened. Romans aren't like that. Romans are, I don't care why that's happening, I just want it fixed. Uh, and that can be seen very much in the way that they prioritise their armed forces, uh, and they are very much a conquering group of people. Um, although the irony is, is that you can't properly solve something unless you understand the causes. There's the irony there. But like I said, the, the Romans aren't going to come up with any new theories about why disease happens. They also believe in the theory of the four humours and they also believe in the concept of gods giving and taking away illness as well. Uh, for a brief period of time, the Romans adopt the gods of the ancient Greeks. So Asclepius is um, followed by the Romans for a little while. You also get Asclepians for a little while in Rome as well, in sorry, the Roman Empire. But they soon develop their own gods and the uh, god of health and healing in the ancient Roman times is called Salus, S-A-L-U-S. But anyway, back to Galen. So Galen is a Roman physician, a Roman doctor who is going to extend on some of Hippocrates' work. And he does that by focusing on treatments and he comes up with the concept of the theory of opposites. And it's something that makes a lot of sense, really, and it's something that to an extent we still use today as well. For instance, if you've got a fever using something cold to treat you, uh, they, Galen very much focused on food and what you were putting into your body. So, for instance, if you had a fever, you'd be recommended lots of cold foods like cucumbers, for instance. And if you had the opposite, if you had a cold, um, then you would be recommended hot, spicy, uh, well-seasoned foods to treat a cold. Uh, again, you know, there's a lot of um, un like kind of sense in that and we still use it to an extent today as well, perhaps less so with what we're eating, but using cold to balance out hot and vice versa. Really, we can see in from an illness point of view extends from what Galen is saying. Galen does some very basic work on the anatomy. Now, the anatomy is about how the body is put together, what the body looks like. Now, in the Roman times, much like the Greek times, much like the medieval times as well, human dissection was forbidden. So the way that Galen gets around this is that he dissects animals instead. And his go to were go to animals were pigs and apes. Uh, in the slide previously in the picture, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen in your course as well, uh, Galen is famously doing this public dissection uh, of a pig. He was a real showman, Galen. He really liked for people to see what the ideas that he was coming up with. So what he wanted to prove was that it was the, um, the vocal cords and not the brain that controlled the voice. And what he does is he gets this pig on a table and squealing away and he makes an incision across the pig's throat and is able to, uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of, uh, expose uh, the pig's vocal cords and cuts them. And he says, and there you go. And the pig stops squealing and the brain is still intact. So that's what he does. But what he then does is he takes the dissections and ex explorations that he does on pigs and apes and applies it to humans. So he makes lots of mistakes. But as we're going to see, Galen's work is going to be used as the backbone, the basis of anatomical knowledge. So for a long, long time, doctors and physicians, or no, a doctor is a physician, doctors and surgeons, that's what I wanted to say, uh, are going to be working based on a lot of incorrect knowledge. The comparison I make, for instance, is imagine if uh, Galen dissected cows. Uh, you may be aware of the fact that a cow has more than one stomach. So a cow would assume that humans did as well. The church, and this is going to be really important when we move into the medieval period very, very shortly, that the church is a massive approver of Galen's ideas. And that is because Galen believes in a divine creator. Now, this is a really, really interesting yes, but moment. Because Galen says, 
the body is so well put together how he knew i don't know because he wasn't allowed to dissect a human body but let's stay with his train of thought the body is so well put together that there is no way it could have just happened by accident so there must have been some kind of divine intervention in the creating of a body in the creation of life and the church the christian church which is developed during the roman times Here's this idea and says, yes, we like that. That matches very much with what we teach about in our big book called the Bible. But the irony, but the yes, but moment is that Galen never says that he believes that that divine creator is God. That's the Catholic church, the Christian church, just kind of joining the dots for themselves there. So Galen's ideas are approved of and will be the basis of medical teaching because of the link that they has with the church and we'll talk more about that in a second when we look at medieval doctors and how they were trained and who trained them as well now such was the commitment to galen's beliefs that the church made it a punishable offense to go against his teachings so essentially, if you were going against Galen, it was like you were going against God. Not that they thought Galen was God, but he was such a strong comparison in his beliefs to what was said in the Bible. It was almost as if Galen's beliefs were holy and that going against them was a crime in the eyes of the church. So both Hippocrates and Galen are going to be incredibly influential in our study of medicine from the medieval times onwards. Let's more, move more now into the medieval period and we're going to be talking about how doctors were trained during the medieval times. Uh, take a look at this picture here, for instance, and you can get a bit of an idea in what we're going to be having a look at. We can easily assume that those texts that they are having a look at there are those of Hippocrates and Galen. Assume, I don't know that for a fact, but it's, you know, it's a, a, a strong inference that can be made. But look at the clothes that they're wearing. Uh, we are really looking at clothes that are highly recognisable uh, from monks. And notice as well, although granted medieval artistry isn't as strong as it possibly could be to make this assumption 100%, but you have got only men learning medicine here. Let's get some key details. So doctors were trained at universities. Not particularly surprising, all doctors are trained at universities nowadays as well. But the difference is, is that at this time, if you went to a university in the medieval times, you went to a university that was run by the church. All universities were run by the church. And because of that, your teaching, your education as a doctor would completely be based in Christianity. It would be completely based around Hippocrates and Galen as well, much like we were discussing about Galen beforehand. Remember, going against Galen is a sin. It is punishable by the church. So very few new ideas were coming about during this time. And it was just based on previous knowledge and importantly, basing it on incorrect knowledge as well. When a doctor was fully qualified, uh, they would be able to diagnose um, a patient by uh, examining their pulse and also by using urine samples as well, which is very very familiar that's exactly what happens nowadays as well however what doesn't happen nowadays is something that the medieval doctors used to do which is they used to drink the urine to test it we don't do that anymore they would of course examine it by color which is something we do do nowadays but they would also drink it as well we don't have to do that anymore luckily our technology has progressed to the point where we don't have to drink uh, urine to diagnose illness so, yeah, using the pulse and urine samples as well. So, again, this ties in with this idea of Hippocrates and observation, not just uh, kind of generally thinking, oh, this could be what's wrong with you. Let's actually investigate. Let's actually explore that. Some doctors would perform bleeding and bloodletting. However, as we're going to see, that would be the main job of a surgeon at this time. The most uh, that a doctor would really do is um, prescribe herbal remedies and they would also recommend prayer as well. Remember, their education was a religious education. So they, as well as believing in things like the four humours and also Galen's theory of opposites, they would also believe that God is sending illness as a punishment for sin. 
So if you are sick, it's because you've done something wrong and you need to atone for that. And prayer is the basis on that. They had lots of other superstitious based cures as well. Uh, we have got some evidence, for instance, of uh, astrology coming into it. So star signs. Um, if you uh, Google something called a zodiac man, uh, you will see a little bit more about that. And it was uh, tied up with bloodletting uh, and about how based on your star sign uh, it is where you would be best bled from on your body. And it would also have a, a connection to where you were most susceptible to disease as well. And I know a lot of people um, have this view that, you know, astrology is superstition and so on and so forth. And obviously, as an educated woman myself, uh, I like to, you know, take certain things with a pinch of salt. But sometimes, you know, you just see these things and you think, oh, my gosh, how is that just a coincidence? So, for instance, I'm a Virgo and I also have an illness in my digestive system, in my stomach. And when you look at the Zodiac Man, that is exactly where they say Virgos have most of their illness problems in their stomach so coincidence possibly i don't know um i uh don't want to discredit myself as an educator here but uh but yes in uh, yeah just just interesting sometimes i mean yeah take things with a pinch of salt but anyway back in the medieval times that was something they very much believed importantly if you wanted to see a doctor you had to be able to pay for it and it wasn't cheap either so for most people, for the vast majority of the population, poor people would trust the wise people in their communities. Uh, sometimes you might have a priest or a monk who was willing to um, kind of give some element of medical advice. But quite often it was the wise woman in your village that you would turn to. She would have had the knowledge that had been passed down across the generations about herbal remedies and so on and so forth as well. And that is a common practice that actually extends, we believe, back to the prehistoric times from uh, looking at uh, anthropological studies, which is when we study societies in this world that live in very similar ways to the prehistoric peoples we are able to notice that it is the wise old women in the villages that are trusted with healthcare. Uh, I've said here everything was based on the theory of the four humours. That's not entirely accurate. Don't get me wrong, the theory of the four humours is incredibly strong at this time, but we cannot underplay during the medieval times how strong the belief was that illness was sent as a punishment from God. Incredibly strong and we're going to see that more when we talk about the Black Death later on in this presentation. So I think it's a bit of a gross generalization I've made there, do forgive me, that saying that everything was based on the theory of the four humours. It was, don't get me wrong, there was a strong presence of the four humours but there was an equally if not stronger presence, some medieval historians might argue, um, of the idea of God sending illness as a punishment for disease. What we're going to have a look at next is surgeons. And if you're wondering why you're showing me a picture outside a barber shop, well, I will tell you that the poles that you can see outside a barber shop actually come from medieval surgery. And this one here is a, a version. It's, obviously, it's been done up. It's been repainted. But this is a an original barber's surgeon pole in a shop outside a shop in Winchester which was back in the medieval times one of the capitals of our country so to be a surgeon you didn't have to have any kind of university training uh, a surgeon was seen more like a craft surgery was like a craft it was something you did with your hands uh, it is very similar for instance to how they would have viewed uh, a carpenter or a blacksmith and because of that to become a surgeon you would need to become an apprentice to a master surgeon so someone who had been through the years of studying and apprenticing as a as a kind of apprentice surgeon and had gone on to be you know kind of top of their game so you would develop your trade over time and this goes on for quite a while. This goes on for quite a while. There was no need for any kind of sorry, university level training for a surgeon because it was work you did with your hands. Surgery was seen as a craft. 
One of the ways that surgeons got a lot of their experience was through battlefield surgery. The medieval period is a very strong period for war and conflict, uh, both in terms of civil war, but also from the point of view of invasions as well. So a lot of surgery was learned on the battlefield, uh, amputations especially. And that's not unique to the medieval times. That's the case that goes back especially to the Roman times. Uh, the Romans were a warmongering society and therefore a lot of their surgical progress was made on the battlefield. And a lot of the techniques used for amputation were taken from the Roman times. So that's how we notice surgeons are learning their craft. Don't get me wrong, that is not to say that every surgeon was a battlefield surgeon, but when we start to see a lot of the major developments in surgery uh, during the medieval period, a lot of them are attributed to war surgeons who are getting lots of that battlefield experience. Most people, poor people especially, would visit a barber surgeon. That's where we get that pole on the outside of the uh, of the shop there, who would perform the bloodletting. And this is still a very very popular treatment used in the medieval times. And uh, if you're thinking, why do they even have the pole on the outside? Well, in medieval towns, pretty much all of the shop signs and all the service signs would have been a visual. It wouldn't have had words because the vast majority of the population was illiterate. So you'd know where the bakery was because it would be the shop with the uh, loaf of bread hanging from the sign. Uh, you'd know where the fishmonger was because there'd be a sign of a fish outside it, if you get my drift. So the barber surgeon was signified, was recognised by that red and white pole. The red to represent the blood, the white to represent the bandages. So visiting a barber surgeon was what most people did if they wanted to be bloodlet. Again, you would need to pay for it, though. So you would need to pay for it. And as we're going to see over time, there's a real kind of snobbery of trained surgeons versus barber surgeons. Barber surgeons are seen as like um, the lesser of people in the surgical world. At this time, um, very little complicated surgery was carried out. Uh, you certainly wouldn't be getting anything like internal surgery at this time, especially because it was forbidden to dissect bodies. So when they needed to perform something maybe a little bit more complicated, like an amputation maybe, although they did do a lot of amputations while people were awake, they would use herbal remedies for anaesthetics. Um, opium and hemlock are two examples of herbal remedies they would use. And their use of herbal remedies was incredibly risky and could potentially lead to somebody dying. And the reason is because it was very difficult to get the dosage right. The amount of anaesthetic somebody needs is based on such a huge number of different factors that need to be considered. So if any of you have had surgery nowadays or you know somebody, for instance, who's had an operation, um, they will have had an anaesthetist, a specialist person there, completely dedicated to the process of making somebody unconscious for the process of an operation. Uh, somebody's weight needs to be taken into consideration, the length of the procedure needs to be taken into consideration, the location of the procedure as well, and so on and so forth. So many different things need to be adjusted and balanced just right so that the anaesthetic that someone is given is going to be helpful and not dangerous. In the medieval times, though, there is no kind of understanding for that. And so therefore, you could be in a situation where you are given too much opium. Opium, incidentally, is where we get heroin from. And if you're given too much, that is going to kill you. However, if you weren't given enough, then it wouldn't work. So it was a real risk giving people those um, herbal remedies. And we'll be using herbal remedies for anaesthetics right up until the industrial era, when medicine and technology develops to the point where chemical anaesthetics are starting to be used. But at this time, we are purely looking at herbal remedies. Uh, a famous British surgeon at this time is John of Ardenne, who wrote of his experiences as a battlefield surgeon. We were talking about battlefield surgery in point two there in the Hundred Years' War. And that is a war and a conflict that existed between Britain and France. Uh, it's the war where we get the story of Joan of Arc as well during the Hundred Years' War. And ironically, it actually goes on for longer uh, than a hundred years. 
But nonetheless, he's a really good example of a specific individual. If you want to know more individuals from medieval surgery, then I strongly recommend you check out my individuals in medicine video. Uh, that is one of the earlier videos that I've popped onto my channel there. And it goes through a couple more people in a bit more detail. Next, we're going to have a look at the uh, use of hospitals during the medieval times. Uh, the picture you can see here is of a hospital in Paris called the Hotel, no, sorry, let me pronounce that better, Hotel Dieu, um, Dieu meaning God. And as we can see, there are very, very strong links to religion in this hospital. Uh, I'll give you a second to take a look at it. You may well have seen it in your lessons quite possibly, but if you haven't, take a look. Start up at 12 o'clock, move around like a clock face because this is a very detailed source and you'll be able to take in lots of different bits and bobs. Think about what you can see that's going on there. Think about who you can see in this picture as well. Think if you want to about gender in this picture as well. How are men and women serving different roles in this picture, for instance? OK, just a little uh, thing to think about when we look at our information. So hospitals and Christianity and their role in medicine as well. As we've already discussed, the Christian church controlled all the teaching of doctors, doctors, excuse me, and dissection was completely forbidden under the church's orders. Uh, the reason why you weren't allowed to dissect a body, and this belief extends back to the Greeks, the Romans and the Egyptians as well, was because you would need your body in the afterlife. That is what was believed. So that's why you couldn't cut up somebody's body. Uh, that is why, for instance, going back to the Egyptians, that is why they embalmed bodies. That's why they created mummies, because they believed people would need their bodies in their afterlife. Again, we've talked about this already as well. The church backed Galen's ideas and punished those who tried to go against his work. Uh, an example of this is Roger Bacon, who tried to, uh, tried to go against Galen's teachings and ended up being imprisoned. So there's a nice specific example you can give an individual to back that up. Religion was incredibly strong in the Middle Ages. And so God sending illness as a punishment for sins was the main belief of why disease happened. And uh, I thought I did mention that briefly beforehand. I'm going to go into it in a tiny bit more detail here. And that is because belief about a God or God himself sending disease as punishment was used for um, illnesses that had no explanation or invisible illnesses. Uh, so, for instance, you know, we talked about the four humours before and about how that was used based on what you could see was happening to somebody's body. Well, sometimes people were ill for reasons you couldn't detect. And that is usually when the belief surrounding religion and spirituality came into it. So that's why we see this presence of God uh, sending illness as a punishment for disease. Because if we think about it, the vast majority, I would say, or OK, maybe I'm making a sweeping general statement, but the way that my mind is working right now is that most illnesses are invisible. You know, most of them you can't really tell on the outside what is happening. So that is why we see this as such a strong belief about why disease happened. Prayer is an incredibly common treatment with that in mind. Uh, sometimes people would go on pilgrimages as well, those special religious journeys uh, to certain locations. Um, for instance, uh, what, although this isn't one in the medieval time, there's one that kind of develops a little bit later on. Uh, Lourdes in France, for instance, is a really uh, even still a modern day example of a place of pilgrimage that people go to uh, in order of, with the hope of being healed uh, by the holy water uh, that exists there. And much like they did in the ancient Greek times and the ancient Roman times as well, uh, people in the medieval times would make offerings uh, at shrines to saints as well. Um, much like how they had uh, in the um, Greek and Roman times, they would have had lots of different gods for different situations, like we had a god of war, a god of illness, for instance. Um, the Christian church gets around this by having lots of saints that were for certain things. So, for instance, you would go to particular saints to make offerings on purpose. Uh, this isn't connected to religion, uh, sorry, to medicine now. But, for instance, one is um, St. Christopher, for instance, who is seen as the god of uh, travel 
and traveling peoples. So for instance, if you knew you were going to be making a journey, then you would go and make an offering on, uh, on behalf of uh, St. Christopher, that side of things. Going back to the picture we just looked at before of the Hotel Dieu in Paris, uh, the church ran hospitals as well, uh, though don't think about it as a hospital like we would recognize them today. Um, if you ended up in a hospital, you weren't going to receive any treatment in the medieval times. Instead, you were going to be taken care of. Uh, people like monks and nuns would make sure you were comfortable, essentially. You were fed, you were, um, I was going to say kept clean, but to an extent, kept clean. Cleanliness is close to godliness, remember? And you wouldn't be receiving any kind of medical treatment. You wouldn't really see a doctor. If you've got a second to go back and have a look at that picture from beforehand, for instance, you'll notice the man who's doing the rounds is a priest. So it's not a hospital like we would recognise it today. It's more so a place you would go and stay. It's almost like a little bit like an Asclepian, in a way, you could argue, that you would go there and, you know, just be taken care of, essentially. We have a lot of hospitals in monasteries at this time as well. And it was part of a monk's duty to care for the sick, not treat them, but to care for the sick. And in monasteries, you would have these parts that were known as infirmaries, which is where we get the term from today. It was for the sick. It was for the infirm to look after them, to care for them. So we're looking a lot so far at the factor of religion being a massive influence in medieval medicine. And what we're really noticing so far is that religion massively hinders medical progress at this time. However, it isn't accurate to say that all religions and all faiths were hindering medical progress. As we're going to see in the countries you've got highlighted on this map here, the Islamic Empire, things were a little bit different. So medical knowledge in the Islamic Empire was much more advanced than it was in Europe. And the reason for that goes way back to the fall of the Roman Empire in the late 400s AD. Now, the Roman Empire expanded all across Western Europe and also into the eastern part of what would become the Islamic Empire. And when the Roman Empire collapsed and in Western Europe, the Goths and the Vandals were the ones who conquered over the Romans. In Western Europe, the Goths and Vandals destroyed everything that the Romans had built. The aqueducts, all the public health systems and things like that. They also burned a lot of the books as well. So a lot of medical knowledge was destroyed. And essentially during the medieval times or um, sorry, I should say rather from roughly about 500 to 1000 AD, roughly, uh, Western Europe was having to almost start again, was having to rebuild and start again. However, the Goths and Vandals did not get as far as the eastern part of the Roman Empire, which is where the Islamic Empire would develop from. So whilst things were being destroyed in the west, things in the east remained. So they didn't have to start again in the what became the Islamic Empire. And instead, they were able to build on the knowledge of the ancient Greeks and ancient Romans. And it's worth saying as well that in the Islamic Empire, it wasn't just medicine that was able to develop. There were so, so many things that were able to develop far more advanced than they were in Western Europe. Uh, another great example is mathematics. And a lot of the developments in mathematics that we work on today are based on developments that were made by a lot of Islamic mathematicians building on the works of uh, significant Greek and Roman mathematicians as well. But back to medicine. Islam, the faith of Islam, taught doctors to find cures for patients, even though they were also taught about Hippocrates and Galen, they were allowed to go against them. So that's a massive difference between Christian and Islamic medicine. They were allowed to go against them. Uh, just to be clear, uh, one of the rules that does exist in both is about uh, not being allowed to dissect human bodies. That still exists uh, in Islamic uh, faith as well. But finding cures was encouraged. Uh, I believe it was... Uh, in the Quran, it is stated that Allah has provided a cure for 
every illness, that there is an antidote out there and you just need to essentially find out what they are. One of the reasons why um, knowledge in the Islamic Empire is able to develop, develop so easily is because everybody in the Islamic Empire spoke Arabic. So it didn't matter if you were writing in Mesopotamia, which is modern day Iraq, or you were writing in Cordoba in Spain, all of you spoke the same language. And because of that, it was so easy to share information. Think about how different that would be in Europe. You know, what the main centralized language in Europe would have been Latin. But even then, only religious peoples were educated in Latin. So to pass knowledge, let's say from, ooh, uh, let's say from Bohemia, which is where the Czech Republic is nowadays, uh, over to Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, you would probably need to change languages about four or five times. And when people translate information, some information is translated incorrectly. And that kind of leads to lots of problems. It's a little bit like uh, the, the concept of Chinese whispers in a way, although I hate that phrase and I'm sure there's a much more politically correct way of saying it nowadays. But that's essentially how it works. The Islamic Empire didn't have that problem. So it was very, very easy to share knowledge and build on knowledge as well. Two individuals that you can reference uh, in regards to progress in Islamic medicine are Ibn Sina, or the European name Avicenna, and Al-Razi, or Razis. Uh, they are two influential um, Arabic doctors, um, Islamic doctors, who wrote lots of influential books. If you want to know more details about them, again, check out my Individuals in Medicine video, uh, and I go through some details about them in that. Now, one of the reasons we know that Islamic medicine was so far progressed and so far advanced is because of a war. This is a great example of both religion and war helping medical progress. So during the Middle Ages, you may well be aware of a conflict known as the Crusades. Now, the Crusades went on for hundreds of years, hundreds of years. Uh, they start in the late 10 hundreds. Uh, I think it's 1096 is the year of the First Crusade, and they go right the way through to the 14th century, to the 1300s. Forgive me, I don't know off the top of my head the year of the last crusade, but it goes on for centuries. And the idea behind the Crusades was that the Christians wanted to go to the Holy Land, to Jerusalem, and retake it for Christianity, because at this time it was part of the Islamic Empire. And so therefore fell under the jurisdiction of Islam. So that's essentially what the Crusades were about. And it went on for hundreds and hundreds of years, lots of toing and froing. One moment the, uh, the Western Christians had captured Jerusalem, for instance, and then it went back into the hands of the Islamic peoples. Um, this in the Crusades is where we start to learn about historical individuals you might have heard of, uh, such as Saladin. Uh, it's when we start to get the legend of Robin Hood. It features um, also the Crusades are where we get the uh, conflicts with Richard the Lionheart and his brother King John as well. So the Crusades are an incredibly significant period in our history, uh, in British history, but they are also something that really unites so many of the different European kingdoms at this time and gives us an opportunity to get an insight into what life was like in the Islamic Empire. So when European doctors would travel with the crusading armies, yep, that's right, they would have had medics in their armies, just like we do nowadays. That's something that goes back to the Roman times. Even the Romans had specific medics in their armies. So when these European armies would go over to the Islamic Empire, to the Holy Lands, they would witness and they would see the difference in medical treatment that existed there. And what would happen is when these crusaders would return back to where they came from, back to Western Europe, they would take those ideas with them. As well as that, they also brought back lots of things like herbs and spices that wouldn't, weren't available um, over in the Western parts of Europe. And also they brought back other knowledge as well, like mathematics. So for instance, this is the time where we start to step away from using Roman numerals. And instead we start to use actual numbers like we recognize them today. The numbers as we recognize them today are developed during the Islamic time. Uh, the concept of the number zero 
as well is brought over from the Islamic era, sorry, from the Islamic empire as well. And a final thing that we use and develop during the medieval times, which is learned from the Islamic empires is castle building as well. So the most sophisticated versions of a castle that you can find now in our country are completely inspired by the concentric castles that already existed in the Islamic empire. Oh, and one last one, the building of domes as well. That was something else that was brought back over. Just wanted to, to demonstrate to you that there, we have a lot to thank this time for in terms of learning from the Islamic empire. But of course, we wanna be focusing in on the medicine side of things. And when these new ideas were brought back over to Europe, they aren't picked up straight away. Remember, we've still got a lot of control from the Christian church and it's going to take some time until anything that goes against Hippocrates and Galen is going to be allowed in Western European medicine. Ah, yes. Now we're on to my favourite bit. In fairness, I love all of it, but uh, I've got a there's a big place in my heart for the Black Death. I absolutely love it. I remember studying it at primary school. I remember studying it in uh, secondary school. I loved learning about it when I was at university as well. And I just adore teaching it. I really, really do. It is such a fascinating thing. And my goodness, what a time to be learning about the Black Death during this coronavirus pandemic, during all of that's happening with COVID-19. There are so many parallels to the Black Death and COVID-19. I mean, don't get me wrong, they're not the same illness, but the way that we're approaching it, the hysteria surrounding it, oh, it's so, so similar. Let's learn a bit more about the Black Death. So in terms of time periods, the Black Death arrives in Great Britain in the year 1348. And it doesn't just appear in Britain, it appears all across Europe and Asia as well. Uh, we believe it originates in some areas of China, hello, coronavirus, and uh, it kind of carries on through mainland Europe thanks to trade links. So this idea of it being carried from boats and people on boats and so on and so forth as well, uh, that's a big part of it. The main symptom of the Black Death was buboes. Uh, you may know it's referred to as the bubonic plague. And the buboes are those kind of lumps that exist on your body. Um, this is something that I do when I teach um, about the Black Death. So if you want to follow me in doing this now, please, by all means, feel free to. So if you take your right hand and form it into a fist, but don't like clench it really tight, just, just have it in a fist. Lift up your left arm and then place your right hand, which is in a fist, into your armpit. OK, if you want to kind of push it in there a little bit. Be my guest. Then close your eyes and slowly lower down your left arm. OK, can you feel that pushing in there? So this is a kind of rough indication of what a huge bubo would feel like. OK, that pain. Can you feel it really digging in there? Feel how sensitive it is on that part of your body. Feel how sensitive it is. Um, buboes varied in sizes. They could, uh, uh, the records demonstrate that in sometimes it was like a rash, but some of them had lumps that grew as large as an apple, which is kind of similar to what we've just demonstrated with our fists just there. And your life expectancy with the Black Death was an average of five days. And by that, I mean, from the first time you realised you had it, i.e. first time you recognised you had a bubo, it would probably take you about five days to pass from the Black Death. There was a huge belief that God sent the Black Death as a punishment for sins, and that was incredibly popular, that the peoples of an earth, on earth had been so evil and so wicked and so sinful that God had to do something to make sure people stopped and listened. And that's why he sent the Black Death, apparently, according to the people in the medieval times. Uh, because of that, prayer was a very, very common treatment. Uh, you may well have seen images of people inflicting pain on themselves, like flagellating, whipping themselves uh, to demonstrate to God just how sorry they were uh, in order to hopefully rid either themselves of the Black Death. But it was more so really used as a prevention. So before you even got it, you kind of got in there first and demonstrated to God how sorry you were. Um, there were also supernatural beliefs about the Black Death as well. For instance, it was believed 
that the alignment of Mars and Saturn led to the Black Death because of them being evil planets and because they got into a particular alignment um, that, that kind of sent bad air, miasma, down onto the planet. So, yeah, beginnings of the miasma theory, uh, the theory that bad smell uh, were causing the Black Death bad smells uh, and to be honest with you it's kind of um, understandable that they would believe that because uh, towns and villages in the medieval times absolutely reeked they were so smelly and so it was kind of obvious that they would blame that perhaps if this place didn't smell so bad it wouldn't be so ill okay so one of the things they did was they again it's like a theory of opposites if it smells bad let's replace it with something that smells good so sweet smells were used to try and replace them. Um, if you have got in your mind now the image of um, these individuals wearing these long cloaks with the beak masks, which were stuffed with herbs and spices and things like that, you are a bit too early. That's going to come about in the Great Plague in the 1600s. The Black Death and the Great Plague are not the same thing. They are very similar, but they are not the same. So that vision you've got of those doctors with those massive beaks, that doesn't come across until the 1600s. And I'm going to talk more about that in the video on Renaissance medicine. So we see the beginnings of miasma theory at this stage. And it was also noticed that you would catch the Black Death if you came into contact with somebody who had it. So we're starting to understand this notion that illness is passed from person to person. Here's a big coronavirus COVID-19 link here. And what a lot of towns and cities did is that they imposed quarantine measures. They locked people away to stop them from spreading the illness. They didn't understand anything about germs at this time. No knowledge of germs at all. They were just picking up on what they noticed. So... For instance, we've got the example of the Italian city of Milan, who shut the gates to the city. Remember, in the medieval times, it was very common for big towns and cities to have these walls built around the outside of them. So what they did was they closed their gates. Nobody was allowed into the city and nobody was allowed out. Now, the consequence of that is that in the city of Milan, the death rate for the Black Death was incredibly high. However, uh, data tells us, records tell us, that in the surrounding areas of Milan, death rate from the Black Death was very low. And those, so therefore those quarantine measures worked. That is why we are using them so much today with COVID-19. So that gives you an idea about some of the causes and the treatments. Of course, the four humours were attributed to the Black Death as well. You would have had bloodletting during the Black Death. Uh, and everything too. Now notice that I haven't mentioned anything about rats here. When I was at university, um, I, like I said, studied medieval history and I, I kind of specialised in the Black Death during that time. And one of the things that I remember really shocked me was that I went to university believing that the Black Death was caused by fleas on rats. And actually, that isn't true. That isn't actually true. We don't know that for a fact. The modern day bubonic plague, which was identified in the late 1800s, the illness called Yersinia pestis, that is transmitted through fleas that live on rodents. But what historians were doing there is that they were arguing backwards. They looked at the bubonic plague and they thought, huh, that's kind of similar to what was happening in the Black Death. So let's say that that's what happened. But actually, we don't know for a fact what actually caused the Black Death. It is highly likely that it was to do with some kind of rodent flea relation, but we don't ever know that for a fact. So something that's something I found really fascinating. And it was one of those kind of like mind blown moments when you kind of sit and realise how much historians argue backwards when we don't have really strong historical knowledge at the time. It's not, not sorry, strong scientific knowledge, medical knowledge at the time. It's very hard to be able to say for a fact, yes, this is what happened. The consequences of the Black Death are incredibly significant, not just for medical history, but also for social history as well. So in Britain alone, it is estimated that a third of the population was killed in Britain. Actually, 
it's only an approximation. And I was listening to a podcast on the Black Death recently or on medieval history recently. And it's actually believed that it was more so likely to be around half of our population. But at least a third of the population was killed. And that is only ever an approximate because we will never know the full number. And the reason is because although in Britain specifically, we were really good at keeping historical records at the time surrounding deaths, the number of people dying from the Black Death got so much and, and it rose so quickly that people keeping the records couldn't keep up. And eventually we got these things known as mass graves, pits in the ground where bodies were literally just thrown into it. So we will never know for a fact the true number of people killed from this illness. It was a great equaliser because both rich and poor were affected by this disease, very similar to as we are seeing with COVID-19. Just because you are wealthy doesn't mean you are protected from this illness. Back in the medieval times, members of royalty, kings were killed as well from the illness. And it was, like I said, a real equaliser, kind of demonstrated that nobody was immune from death. And it really kind of humanised to an extent. It kind of humanised a lot of very powerful people. And I don't mean that in a kind of really positive way, like, hey, guys, I'm human too, because actually that went right against the kind of propaganda that a lot of um, members of royalty were putting out there. A lot of members of royalty, not just in Britain, but in other countries as well, really strongly believed in this concept of divine right, that they were chosen by God to rule. So let's put those two things together. If you believe in divine right, you believe that you as a king, you are put on the throne by God. God had destined you to rule. But if you also got the black death, then God has sent that illness to you as a punishment. So it's a real kind of battle of conquest of beliefs here. Uh, so this idea of the people of power being humanized wasn't always a good thing. At least not in the eyes of the rulers themselves. Some towns and villages are left completely deserted by the Black Death. Uh, some villages and towns of people leave and go elsewhere. And some like Milan, for instance, well, Milan wasn't completely wiped out, but there are some smaller villages, for instance, that are completely wiped out from the Black Death. So a massive impact on our population. However, and this is where we start to think about longer term consequences here. Uh, for the survivors of the Black Death, life got a lot better and it got better for them financially. And it's because they could demand higher wages for the work that needed to be done. Now, that is because there was still work to be done to make sure life could go on. Harvesting crops is a great example. But there weren't as many people around to do the job. So if you were a peasant farmer and the lord of your land, your landlord, called upon you to harvest the crops, you could say to your landlord, I'll do it, but you need to pay me higher wages. You need to pay me more. And if that landlord turned around and said, I'm not paying you anymore, you're a peasant. Then you would say, fine, I'll go and find a landlord that will pay me. Good luck harvesting your crops without the peasants there to do it for you. You want us to do it, you pay us properly. And that's what happened. People started to demand higher wages and because of the desperate situation, they got those higher wages. And so because of that, because they were getting more money, their standard of living improved. They were able to afford better clothing, able to improve their homes that they lived on, able to afford better farming equipment. So surviving the Black Death meant your life actually improved. Although that wouldn't happen overnight, that would take a long time to come in. Uh, along with this idea was the concept that the feudal system, especially in Britain that existed, the idea that you had the king at the top, then the barons, the knights, and then your peasantry, it essentially collapsed following the Black Death because there wasn't enough people in society to uphold the feudal system. And because the peasants were getting richer, it wouldn't work. This concept of being able to uh, essentially, oh, not the word abuse, what's the word I want? Um, Oh my God, what is the word? 
um, to exploit, that's the word I want, to exploit the people lower down in your system, that was getting harder and harder because as the peasants were getting more money, they were getting more and more powerful as well. Uh, one of the connections we can make to an event in British history is the Peasants' Revolt of 1381, which some of you may well have learned about. You don't need to know it for this study, but in terms of just making you aware of other history that is going on, we are talking about a time when the peasants are rebelling against the leaders of the land and demanding better conditions. One of the other consequences of the Black Death is that many people began to lose their faith in God and they started to question the church. Um, just to say that, although I've said many people do this, it doesn't happen universally. Some people's faith is strengthened by the Black Death. For instance, especially if you are a survivor, well, you would be a survivor if you were on the consequences of the Black Death. Some people would have believed, oh my gosh, it was my faith in God that saw me through. God has clearly wanted me to survive to do his work. So for some people, a lot of people are really strengthened in their faith. However, some people are starting to question their faith. They are starting to think, I prayed. I did exactly as I should. I, lay, I led a devout life. I was not sinful. Yet still, God sent this illness and has like, killed all the members of my family. What kind of loving God would do that? So a lot of people are starting to turn their back on the church. Not everyone, but some people are. And this is one of the reasons why the Renaissance happens. This rebirth in old ideas and scientific developments happens for one factor, because people are starting to question the power of the church. More on that in the next video, though. Finally, then, we're going to look at medieval public health. Goodness gracious me, I love this picture. Let's look at the condition in that town. I can almost smell that town. Like I said, these places were very, very pungent indeed. Or you can also see, uh, look outside the shops, you'll see what I was talking about beforehand with this idea that the, um, the shops all had signs outside of them uh, demonstrating what kind of services uh, that they offered. So you can see them there, all pictures because nobody could read at this time. Well, some people could read, but not many people. There was no formal government during the Middle Ages. That's important because only a government can introduce public health laws. So in Britain, what happened was that there were lots of different laws regarding public health all across the country. Individual areas, individual counties, individual towns made their own public health rules. So you could have a rule in London that didn't apply in Dorset, for instance. OK, so public health rules differed all across the country because there was no central government at this time during the Middle Ages. Don't get me wrong. You will. Those of you who maybe even go on to study medieval history further, you will hear a reference being made to a government. But they are more so a panel of advisors to the monarchs. There is no central government that is imposing laws across the country. It's almost a little bit about like how laws in America work. How, for instance, there are some laws that do impact the whole country, but then individual states are able to make their own laws as well. Towns and villages were very, very dirty. There were no proper sewage systems at this time whatsoever. Remember I said in, uh, when we were talking about Islamic medicine, how the Goths and Vandals demolished all of the public health systems that the Romans created, all the proper running water systems and so on and so forth. So as a consequence, towns and villages were dirty, they were very smelly and it was common practice at this time to throw your bodily waste and your rubbish out into the middle of the streets. Rivers and streams were the main source of water, but these were also dirty. And that is generally because the towns and uh, sorry, the streets and towns and villages would often roll into a water supply like a river. Um, because the water was so dirty, people didn't drink it was rarely drunk anyway. Um, instead, people would have drunk ale, they would have drunk beer or cider. Uh, don't get excited, we're, you know, we're not talking about levels of alcohol like we would recognise today. Um, because it was so weak, even children would have drunk ale, beer and cider as well, because the water was just so absolutely rancid. 
be careful. They aren't drinking it because they're like, oh, no, I'm not going to drink that. It's full of germs. They didn't think that at this time because they had no idea about germs. But they did believe in miasma. They did believe in bad smell causing disease. So that's why they aren't touching the dirty water. And also, that's just good life advice. Don't drink dirty water. Some councils in Britain encourage people to keep the front of their houses clean and to remove their rubbish. But there was very little enforcement of these rules. Uh, in some places, you might get somebody, for instance, who would be put in the stocks. You know that thing where you put your hand and your head, sorry, your hands and your head through the stocks. Uh, maybe they might be put in that because I don't know they were caught urinating in a public place. But generally speaking, you know, if your the front of your house was dirty, someone might come around and say you need to clean that up. But there was very little enforcement going on here. The people who had the best public health or the cleanliest living conditions were monks and monasteries and because of the huge amount of money that the church had in the middle ages they were able to provide proper sanitary systems for monks there is even some records of a very basic version of a flushing toilet in a monastery we wouldn't have flushing toilets properly in people's houses until the late 1800s so this is huge also, we've got a little bit of a link to religion there. I mentioned that phrase before. Cleanliness is close to godliness. So it was a big belief that monks had to be clean because of that. So they're the ones who are kind of holding on to all of the, uh, the best public health resources at this time, whilst the people that they served in their community were smelly and dirty. One other place where you could possibly access nice, clean water would have been like up in the mountains where the streams and the sources of the water were created. But that isn't something that would have been available to lots of people. And we're done. So that is your introduction to medieval medicine. I say introduction, that was actually pretty thorough, um, but I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you found it useful. Tell your friends if they're struggling with their medical study. Come and check me out on One History Help. Lots and lots of videos on there being developed. We've got everything on America there now. And there'll be more videos coming for medicine as well. Don't forget you can subscribe to my channel so you can get notified when new videos are put up. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram. You can find me at One History Help. And also I'm on Facebook too. Just search One History Help and you'll find me there. Thank you very much for staying with me through this presentation, guys. And I'll speak to you again very, very soon. Bye-bye.